we owe a debt of gratitude to Eve Ball for her history of the Warm Springs Apaches. As recalled by sons and daughters of the leaders of those Indians and narrated by James Kiawakla. Eve's story is proof that she was kind and sympathetic and patient with the people who gave her the Indian versions of occurrences pertaining to their tribe. An Indian does not tell every white man he meets the stories of his people. And for good reason. I remember hearing my mother say, if she keeps on nagging her old man, she'll give him a drink. At that time, it was a puzzle. But now, years later, I know what she meant. That's what happened to our good Indians. White men, often a bunch of bums, abused the Indians and robbed them. Is it surprising they were frustrated and they took the bottle? Not all Americans have been honest enough to try to understand this. Much has been written by the white man about the Apache. Accounts have been written as military reports by young officers ambitious for promotion. Reports have been compiled by Indian agents, by contemporary newspapers whose owners depended upon advertising, paid for by merchants who lived by selling supplies to the reservations, by pioneers who entered country occupied and claimed by the Apaches, especially following the Civil War. Some of those stories were written by men who wanted to take over Apache countries, but because of heroic resistance from the part of the Apaches were not immediately able to realize their objective. Seeking the support of public opinion, these intruders often pictured the Apache not only as warlike, but cruel and vicious, a people who should be driven from the mountains of the Southwest. At best, the truths of, in these portrayals were only partial. At worst, there were no truths at all. The Indians have a philosophy of life in many ways better than what we have. How, for instance, can we compare our value of suffering with that of the Apaches? In the old days, they trained their children to suffer because they knew suffering would come into every life. But that philosophy was not evaluated, nor was it its existence even recognized in most of the white man's writing about the Apaches. It is in this interest of historical accuracy to correct some of these erroneous or equivocal impressions by countering much of that story from 1878 to 1886 after their generation who related these events to Eve. The generation to follow can know little at first hand of the story of the history of its people. In 1916, it was assigned as a missionary of the order of Franciscan monk to the Muscular Apaches. Three years before I arrived there, the Chirahakua Apaches, as well as some of the Warm Springs and Ned Nihis, were brought to Muscalero Reservation to join the tribe and exercise equal rights with the Muscaleros. Night after night for many years, I sat about their fires at homes and listened to their stories I heard from their own lips accounts given by descendants of Mangas Corolares, Cochise, Victorio, Ju, Nana, Chihuahua, Niche, Geronimo, Perico, Roman Grande, Big Mouth, Magush, Natzili, Gregorio, Sans Puer, Shantaboy, and many other Apaches, Chirahakua and Mascalero, Lipen, and Hiricario. In the main in the main, their stories were the same as those told by Eve Ball, by James Kayawakla, and other informants. Historians should welcome this opportunity to seek the truth on the side of the Apaches. Therein is the great value of Eve Ball's book, that she has presented the versions of events most meaningful to the Apaches themselves. Father Albert Veron, OFM. Author's Preface Fourteen years before I wrote the first word, I thought I was ready to begin writing about the Apaches. I had read the best source books and made the customary notes. History seemed to be a compilation of excerpts from various sources, good sources joined together like beads on a string. Though the Muscalero Apaches came to my hometown, the village of Rio Doso, New Mexico, to trade, nobody seemed to know much about them. The women trudged for miles with babies on their backs and nobody asked them for a ride. I was told that each Indian in the Muscular Apache Reservation received a check each month from the government. People believed this to be true, but I wanted to know. It was not true. 
I found it very difficult to penetrate the wall of reserve behind which the Apaches kept themselves. I met Ramona Chihuahua Daklugi, wife of Asa Daklugi, and through her sought an interview with her husband. It was four years before he decided to talk to me. He was very influential among his people and induced several of them to talk to me also. When James Cuyahuacla made his annual visit in July to Muscalero for the ceremonials for the maidens, my Apache friends brought him to see me. Over a period of years following, he dictated to me his memories of the events of his childhood. There were several men who could have been the narrator of the Apache story, for all of them were full participants in the turbulent history of the 1870s and the 1880s. James Kiowakla, perhaps James Kiowakla, perhaps because he lived longer than the others, and perhaps because he lived away from the reservations and felt more freedom to speak, was able to spend the greatest amount of time in recounting to me the oral history of his people. Sometimes others also contributed to accounts of their personal experience or those of their fathers, among them Big Mouth, the last living scout on the Muscalero Apache Reservation, Eugene Chihuahua, son of Chief Chihuahua, Jenny Chihuahua, wife of Eugene Chihuahua, Ramona Chihuahua, Diklugi, daughter of Chief Chihuahua and wife of Diklugi, Ace Diklugi, son of Nedni, Chief, Jua, and Geronimo's nephew and chosen successor, Isabel Perico and Jadi, daughter of Perico, half brother of Geronimo, Da Teste, widow of Scout Cooney, Hugh and Eliza Cooney, his children, Jasper Khan Sahe, Nicholas, son of famous Chiaharcua runner Nicholas, his father, Mini Zurega, Nelson. Kedi Zini, cousin of Nicholas, Moses Loco, grandson of Chief Loco, Benedict Joshe, grandson of Joshe, George Martine, son of Scout Martine, Charlie Smith, who, with his mother, was captured by Geronimo's band and remained with them three years till sent to Florida, Willie Magouche, son of Leapin Chief Magouche, Salon Sombrero, grandson of Chief Nat Zili, Christian Barnaby, and Amelia Naiche, children of Chief Naiche, Ralph Shanta, son of Shantaboy, Lydia Shanta, daughter of Daklugi, Maud Geronimo, daughter of Daklugi, Alton Bessel, son of Chief Bessel, and Alton's sister, May Bessel, May Bessel II. Some of these Apaches read the books I had valued so highly, and I was privileged to hear their reactions to the reports of the books. My books are filled with marginal notes in which the Apaches, who had been present at various occurrences, differed with the writers. In the years I made a very sobering discovery. I knew almost nothing about Apaches. To know a people, one must be able to anticipate the reactions to certain circumstances. I learned that from James Kiowakla. Which do you believe, me or that book, he would ask. Both, especially if your accounts coincide, I assured him. I use the best books written about the Apaches, mostly for checking discrepancies among reports from witnesses of events which they related. I found many discrepancies. In writing this book, I am telling Kiowakla's story. I have checked with it stories of other older members of the Warm Springs and Chirahakua bands, and have seen that even among themselves they differ in minor details. In chapter notes, I have called some attention to various accounts to which they object, but this is Kiowakla's story, and he had the support of his contemporaries in telling it. He accepted his grandmother's account of the occurrences at Tres Castillos, though he is informed as to conflicting records left by the officers and recorded by historians. He had no reason to believe, for example, that Chief Victorio was not an Apache, yet he respected the conflicting opinions of those who hold this in question. After years of almost daily contact with these people, I realize that I may still not be adequate for the task I have undertaken. I still do not understand them as 
one should who attempts to recreate their experiences and their injustices at the hands of my race. Yet I could not in my lifetime do them justice, nor in all probability could anyone else living who has the opportunity that I have had to hear their stories from their own lips. It is my hope that this account of their sufferings may bring about sympathy and understanding among the children of their conquerors. These qualities have been lacking, but I sense a growing trend in our times towards realization of those the wrongs the Apaches have endured. I feel hopeful that the U.S. government may, before the race is extinct, rectify some of them. As an example for the reservations of which they were deprived, those of Cochise in Arizona and Victorio in New Mexico, no rem remuneration has been received, though claims for it have been in litigation for many years. Of the Chittahakua and Warm Springs Apaches who went to Florida in 1886, only four were living by 1968. Two of the Muscalero Apache Reservation, Eugene Chihuahua and Helen Chato, widow of the scout. There were two at Apache, Oklahoma, Miss Talbot Goodday and Mrs. David Cheney, who died in 1969. The Apaches were prisoners of war for 27 years. From the time that we were as peaceful non-combatants were driven from our reservation until we were herded aboard a train at Holbrook, Arizona, and shipped to Florida in 1886, we had been hunted through the forests and plains of our own land as though we were wild animals. I have read widely and am familiar with the military reports about my people and with the records of the historians. Some of those records have been set down with sympathy and accuracy. I respect historians' attempts to record the deeds of my people. These men, even I, as I am doing, have written either what they saw or were told by people on those where they relied. For 27 years, my people were prisoners of war. For several of those years, I was a student at Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. When I returned to my people, they had been moved from Florida via Mount Vernon Barracks, Alabama, to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Some of the older ones were dead, among them Nana. Katayani, my stepfather, had been Nana's companion for years and had taken over his office as historian. Kaitanai, mother and grandmother, were teaching the young of our tribe the old stories and traditions. I married Dorothy Naishe, daughter of the Chirahakua chief Naishe, and therefore was closely associated with this leader for years. Chief Loco was my relative also, and I heard his version of events. I also knew Geronimo, who dictated his experiences to G. M. Barrett with Asai Deklugi, son of Chief Jua, interpreting. Jason Betzinez, though a mature man, had been in Carlisle with me, as had Jasper Kansahe, and all of us sought to preserve the history of our peoples. I say peoples, though the white eyes designated the members of all four different Apache bands as Chitahakua. This was an error, for only the tribes of Cochise and Chihuahua were true Chirahakua. In our own tongue, we were Chihenine, red people. This does not refer to the color of our skins, but to the band of red clay drawn across our faces. Jua was chief of the Nednihi, Apaches, whose stronghold was in the Sierra Madre of Mexico. Geronimo was leader, but not chief, of the Bendoc Coges, whose territory was around the headwaters of Gila. Though closely associated, we were distinct groups. Of the Apaches taken to Florida, very few were living as I tell this story on the Moscolo Apache Reservation in New Mexico. Chapter 1. Flight I was awakened by shots, and I knew that it had come. Screams! More shots! Entangled in my blanket, I struggled to my feet. Grandmother lifted me to her shoulders and ran from our brush arbor on the east slope of the mountain. Above us, a wikiup burst into flames as she ran towards the spring. People on foot raced past us. A horse almost ran us down. There were flashes of fire and the whine of bullets. Grandmother stumbled across a body, but regained her footing. Tight, tight, Torres, she muttered 
as she stooped to fill partially her water jug. Then she followed the soft thud of moccasins up the steep slope of the mesa. It seemed a long time before she reached the rim. Trembling with exhaustion, she put me down and took my hand. We ran toward a clump of vegetation, and there she stooped to fold and arrange the blankets. She set out for another clump of mesquite, and from one to another we went. As I trotted beside her, I could see the faint glow of dawn before us. I tried hard to keep the pace. When I fell behind, she lifted me again and did not stop until she reached the bank of a dry arroyo. She dropped me into the arroyo, and we lay flat until we could breathe easily. Then she set out, crawling on hands and knees, up the watercourse. I followed, moving when she did, stopping when she stopped. Creep and freeze, creep and freeze. She'd taught me that game, and I'd played it with other children at Ojo Caliente, Warm Springs. My hands touched damp sand, and I knew some of the water had been spilled from the jug. The arroyo bent sharply to the east, and Grandmother stopped to listen before rounding the turn. I heard hoofs of horses, shod horses, coming close. Then came the jingle of metal and the sound of harsh voices, white eye voices. I lay still and held my breath. A horse snorted. He smelled us. There was a long silence. Then I heard them plunge into the arroyo and scramble up the east bank. The sounds gradually died away, but we lay still for a long time. Daylight was upon us before Grandmother resumed her crawling. She did not risk raising her head to look after the cavalry until we reached a place where the bank was well screened with cactus. The blue coats were still riding towards the Rio Bravo, Rio Grande. She let them drink from the jug, and she gave me a handful of dried venison from the buckskin bag attached to her belt. I, too, had a food bag, a small one containing mesquite bean meal. For months, no Apache child had been without his emergency rations, nor had he slept without an abomination not to remove it and not to abandon his blanket in case of attack. My food bag had never left me day or night. You're a good boy. You kept your blanket. Where's Siki? Asterisk, I asked. She left the village before we did. I had given her instructions long ago to where to stop so that we can find her. I hope she remembers. If she obeys, the soldiers will not capture her. Why do they hunt us? They have orders to kill every Apache man, woman, or child found off the reservation. But this is our reservation. It is no longer ours. The land Usin created and gave to the Apache is no longer ours. This, the land promised to Victorio by the great Nantan in Washington, has been taken from us. Asterisk, daughter of Chief Local, cousin of Kiowaka. That was Siki. He promised it to our chief and our people forever, and only two summers ago. Perhaps the gold for which the white eyes grovel in the earth has been found in the R Mountains. Because of that, the word of the great white chief means nothing. He has ordered that we go to San Carlos, the worst place in all of Apacheria, the vast land of our people. I have been to that place when Victorio took his people there. So many died that when we fled from it and returned to Warm Springs, you too went, but you were too small to remember. Not many babies lived to return. Victorio will die fighting before he will permit the Warm Springs Apaches to be forced back to San Carlos again. Instead, we go to the Great River where we meet those of us who escaped. Grandfather Nana will go to the three chiefs of the Mascaleros, our brothers, and ask for refuge in their reservation. He is to meet us at the river with horses and ammunition. Is it far to the river? Not if we could stand and walk. Moving as we do, it is perhaps three days. I think it may have been mid-afternoon before we reached the head of the arroyo. He had a bare ridge to cross. We had a bare ridge to cross, one with little cover except occasional clumps of bare grass and scattered stones. We lay flat and wriggled from one cover to another until well over the crest. 
Several times Grandmother spied moving dots, and each time we lay motionless until she felt sure that the soldiers were still riding towards the east. She knew that with field glasses they might see us. We made our way southeast until we reached the head of an another dry stream bed leading to Cochillo Canyon. We slipped between the protecting banks and worked our way south. There was a Mexican village in the canyon, but Grandmother knew we had little to fear from it. The arroyo gradually became deep enough that Grandmother could stand and walk without fear of being seen. Towards dark, we reached an overhanging rock. The encircling walls formed a sort of cave, open only on one side. She stopped and called softly. In the darkness, something moved. She called again. A quail whistle, and a shadow stole towards us. Siki. Yes, Grandmother. I waited as you told me. Endure. Good. I was afraid you might not find the place. I had no trouble, Grandmother. I'm hungry. So am I. So is Torres. But he has not asked for food. You had a bag. Where is it? I took it from my belt to sleep. Torres did not. He obeyed. To obey is to live. And your blanket? I was frightened. So was I. So was Torres. But he held on to his blanket. I'm sorry, Grandmother. You're sorry? You know it is every one for himself. Siki crept from under the rock. I'll go, Grandmother. You will not. Go back and sit down. She took a handful of dried venison from her bag and mesquite meal from mine. She handed it to Siki. Then she filled my hand and took a small portion for herself. We ate. She bade Siki lie next to the wall and me beside her. She spread both blankets over us and crept from under the edge of them with her face to the open side, knife in hand, until she slept. Before dawn, she had us on our way across a gentle slope toward another arroyo. Once within its banks, we walked until Grandmother stopped to examine a trail sign. It was a row of little stones with a slightly larger one at the end. A woman and children, seven in all. Too many. They should have separated so that each group might have a chance to live. An hour or so later, she found another message. Four had turned east. The rest kept south. Endure. Why? The older children have struck out east to the river. Until almost evening, we moved cautiously. I was very thirsty, but knew better than to ask for water. The jug was empty but Grandmother continued to carry it, for it requires much time and labor to weave a wicker jug and coat it with piñon gum so it will not leak. We were near the Cuchillo. The arroyo was deep, with much vegetation along its banks, and we did not leave its shelter until dark. We walked cautiously, stopping often to listen and to sniff the air. I think I caught the tantalizing odor of meat as soon as Grandmother Burning wood, too. I was cold as well as hungry and thirsty. Grandmother murmured in order, and Siki and I sank to the ground. She was gone some time before we heard the quail call. Siki touched me. We waited for a second call before answering. Grandmother came with water, and we drank. A sheep herder's camp, not a Mexican, but a white eye. He has gone to Cochillo, but it's not far. He may come back soon. Come. Flames flickered before the queer, square teepee. The meat was suspended above them instead of being laid on coals in the proper manner. I dropped near the welcome fire while Grandmother and Siki went into the tent. In a very short time, they returned with bundles wrapped in white cloth. Siki had a blanket and a knife. They cut the meat, and each carried a piece. In the shelter of the next arroyo, we ate the partially cooked food. Grandmother cut long strips of meat. Mine she cut into small chunks, but she and Siki placed the ends in their mouths and deftly severed the bits with their knives. I was so hungry that I crammed two at a time into my mouth and chewed greedily. Not so fast, Otis. You must eat like a chief, for you come from a long line of them. You can never be one unless you practice self-control. A chief must have good manners. I know that Nana never acted as though he were hungry, though he must often have been. I ate more slowly, enjoying every morsel of the good food, 
Then I stretched out on the ground and must have slept almost instantly. I awoke when grandmother touched me. We must walk. Before day, we must cross the big trail of the white eyes and their journeys up to the river. Are we close to the river? About halfway between it and Cuchillo. Why does grandfather say that Cuchillo Negro is a good name? It's a name of Black Knife, a chief of our relative. And a black knife is not easily seen. That is why we darken the handles with clay. Apaches do not like to travel by night, but grandmother had no choice in the matter. When I became too weary to keep up, she or Siki carried me. I did not know when they reached the river. I awoke in a mesquite thicket where a little group of our people was huddled. Siki rolled up in her blanket and slept, but grandmother went among them to check for the missing. The next time I awoke, Grandfather sat beside me rubbing his lame foot. His face was wrinkled and thin. His body was wrinkled and thin. He was tall, almost as tall as Naishe, who was the tallest of the Apaches. Nana was old. How old he did not know. In our tongue he was called Broken Foot, but never in his presence. It was rude to name one in his hearing, and when necessary to refer to him, it was customary to call him Nantan, or Leader. To tell the story, however, I call my people by name. It was not custom to do so. Nor did anyone mention grandfather's infirmity in his presence. He asked no odds because of either age or lameness, and frail though he was, Nana was universally feared and respected for his fighting ability. When I looked into his shrewd old eyes, he smiled and drew into me the embrace that is a greeting between men of our tribe. Then strong hands lifted me, and I was enfolded in the arms of my father. My mother, Goyuan, wise woman, next embraced but did not kiss me, for that was an intimacy abhorrent to Apaches. I had seen little of my parents, for my father was a brave warrior, and my mother's place was at his side. She prepared food, dressed wounds, and when necessary, fought beside him as bravely as any man. She, like all Apache wives, spaced her children about four years apart, and as soon as a baby could be separated from her, turned it over to the care of its grandmother. I asked for my grandmother. Mother smiled and reminded me that she could not come to us because of my father's presence. I saw her standing some distance away with her back to us. I want grandmother, I said. Then go to her, mother replied. It is natural that you love her best of the family. She has taken care of you since you were a baby. Go you on. Your name fits you well. You are intelligent with reason. You understand why the boy loves his grandmother, said my father. Riders with many horses were entering the thicket. My parents joined them as they dismounted. My father led two mounts apart and grandmother obeyed his summons to join him. You came by the camp for which we fled? Yes, my sister. We buried the dead. Fortunately, there were few. The lame one, two women, and the entire family camped on the hill above you. They camped apart for your protection of the larger group and gave their lives that you might escape. We recovered many of the horses stampeded by the cavalry, and we covered many of theirs, enough, I think, to mount all who made it here. The river is rising rapidly. In a short time, it may be impossible to cross. Prepare to ride. From the stores brought in by the warriors, people hastily filled their individual food bags. They divided ammunition, rolled blankets, and tied them to saddles. My grandmother mounted a cavalry horse, and Nana lifted me to a seat behind her. He took a buckskin thong and tied my belt firmly to hers. He saw that the blankets were secure and turned the horse to the water's edge. Siki astride another, followed. Where's mother? I asked. She rides with your father and Nana on another raid. The long line of horses faced the current. The woman began to sing the prayer to the great river. It was accompanied by the ululating sound produced by tapping the hand over the open mouth. This prayer had long been used by my people to secure a safe crossing when the river was in flood. As the singing ended, 
I saw flashes of turquoise as pieces were tossed into the angry water. That was the signal to plunge into the stream, but nobody moved. When Blanco, my father's brother, rode along the line, urging first one and then another to ride into the torrent. He was a medicine man with great power, but they did not obey. I heard him chide them. When there is no danger, you forget Usen, but when you feel for your lives, you pray to him. You pay little heed when I tell you how to live, but when you face death, you remember your religion. Songs and prayers avail little to those who have not lived according to the will of Usen. You are in much greater danger from the cavalry on your trail than from the river. Is there no brave woman who will take the lead? Grandmother urged her mount to brink and tried to force him to take the plunge. There was a commotion along the line parted to let a rider through. I saw a magnificent woman on a beautiful black horse, Lozen, sister of Victorio. Lozen, the woman warrior, high above her head as she held her rifle. There was glitter as her right foot lifted and struck the shoulder of her horse. He reared, then plunged into the torrent. She turned his head upstream, and he began swimming. Grandmother called to Siki to follow as cold water splashed onto my face. She bent forward, and so did I. Water tugged at my feet and then my waist. When it washed over my shoulders, I clung to Grandmother. My head went under, and then it lifted above the water. The horse swam steadily across the broad stream until he found footing. His four legs lifted, and he scrambled onto a hidden ledge and wadded ashore. I kept my seat until he began shaking himself. Then I began slipping until Grandmother pushed me back in place. Horses were floundering in the shallow water and coming ashore. One had washed downstream with its rider until Lozen overtook it and got up to the bank. When Lozen joined us, people had dismounted and begun to wring the water out of the clothing and blankets. Lozen came straight to Grandmother. You take charge now. I must return to the warriors. Head for the sacred mountain in the San Andreas and permit only short stops until you reach it. Camp near the spring. Wait there until Nana comes. We can spare no men, but the young boys will obey your orders. Nana has told them that you are in charge. Get the people mounted and start. I go join my brother. Grandmother told the half-grown lads that theirs was the most dangerous of all positions, that of rear guard. Then she led the way, with the long line following. <laughs>